Now I'm very honored to introduce Dietrich Dietrichsen, whom you might at least know through the essay he generously contributed to the Katie Noland exhibition brochure. In the 1980s, Dietrich Dietrichsen has been editor and part of the editorial board of music journals like Sounds and Specs, and is teaching since the 90s as university teacher and visiting professor in Germany and abroad, among others in Frankfurt and Offenbach, Los Angeles and Pasadena. From 1998 to 2007, he was professor for aesthetic theory and cultural studies at the Merz Academy in Stuttgart, and is since then professor for theory, practice, and communication of contemporary art at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. I will mention only a few of his extensive list of publications that make visible the range of interest in a critical reading of art and popular culture. Overproduction and Value, released in 2018, Körpertreffer, zur Ästhetik der nachpopulären Künste, 2017, über Popmusik, 2014, über den Mehrwert in der Kunst, Kritik des Auges, Texte zur Kunst und Eigenblutdoping, Selbstverwertung, Künstlerromantik, Partizipation, all from 2008. Among the exhibition catalogs he co-edited are Blühendes Gift zur feministischen Appropriation des österreichischen Unbewussten, 2015, and the whole earth, Californian und das Verschwinden des Außen in 2013. He is regularly contributing to journals, journals and magazines like Taz or Art Forum, Theater Heute or Texte zur Kunst. So once again, we are very happy to have you here and please join me in welcoming Dietrich Dietrichsen. Der Baumarkt der Transgression. Mach dein Ding. Hardware store and transgression, doing your thing. Das bezieht sich auf einen this refers to an advertising slogan for a DIY store in uh, German uh, television. Not philosophy, not for the time being at least. In 1986, for the first time, I heard of the band, the punk band, Ed Gein's Car. A little later, the song Ed Gein appeared on the album Intellectuals of the Shoestrain Boys of the Ruling Elite by the band Killdozer. So I thought, hmm, this Ed Gein is somebody after all. Soon afterwards, there were songs about Ed Gein by psychotic homicidal dismembrance and the death metal pioneers Macabre, and then from a band which was called To Ed Gein. So the trend continued and continued, and up to today there are six different bands called Ed, called Ed Gein, in fact, five, bed, five um, bands and a DJ, and as well there's Ed Gein Motherfucker, the drum and bass duo Gein, the Ed Gein fan club, and the band Vampire Lesbos that called their label Ed Gein Productions. So he seemed to be a really important guy, this Ed Gein. And very often at the time, this was in the 80s, the name Ted Bundy cropped up in conjunction with Ted Gein, and in the course of the late 80s, there were five bands named after him, Ted Bundy's VW as well. So cars seem to be important both for Ed and Ted. We'll come back to cars and car dealers later. Jeffrey Dahmer, round about 85, counted a princely sum of homages in sung song titles uh, Done no band with his name. So I wonder what have Dama, Gain, and Bundy in common? And I'm sure nobody here nowadays has ever heard of them. Well, they were all US serial killers, particularly spectacular, cruel, tr transgressive serial killers. Hannibal Lecter was the mainstream version. That was a big thing in the late 80s. However, no one managed to not, not up nearly as many references than the person who was the first to establish the correlation between serial killing and counterculture. Charles Mans Ban Manson. Seven bands were named after him, not including Marilyn Manson. And there are 1,114 publications, according to this box, of Charles Manson. And this includes uh, three hours of material and his interviews and so on. This begins in the 80s. Now, Ed Gein was the killer referred to in 
the Top Hooper horror film, which was banned for some time, Texas Chain Massacre. But even Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho used motives from his biography. Following Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which uh, in 1976 was mentioned by the Ramones in their song Texas Chainsaw Massacre, took my baby away from me. And then a series of film series developed which the same public um, consumed and liked that actually set up these bands. And this also began in the early middle 80s, first of all with The Evil Dead by Sam Raimi. And as many people who started off with the horror business moved to fantasy plus the first soul the various uh, sequels, Friday the 13th, Freddy Krueger films in Evil Dead, then the Friday the 13th series, as I said, and the Freddy Krueger films. It was even a TV series. Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer, was the talk of the town at the, at the end of the 80s, and Herschel Gordon Lewis was uh, rediscovered as the granddad of the genre. He was torn out of his uh, well-earned retirement. And I, in fact, had the pleasure of carrying out an interview with uh, this old master of the genre, which was so estimated and appreciated by Jean Le Godard at the end of the 80s. Now, the question is, the sub and partially still culture, uh, counterculture, why the, the people living in the punk and hardcore field, why did they like serial killers so much? Why? When you went to hardcore concerts in crowded halls and youth centers where people were vegan back then and sometimes they lived straight edge that is dramatic abstinent uh, lifestyle and they shunned completely shunned uh, sexistic sexistic uh, behavior sexist behavior why did they like so much these songs about men who split open women in bands who call themselves after men who do so when the deeds carried out by serial killers are reconstrued, very often it seems that they were DIY men. The horror is not only in the drastically staged murders, but the real horror is when the special agents or the prospective victims find the hobby, the center, the, the laboratory of the man, and on the basis of tools, utensils, trace elements, they construe what, in fact, happened here, or which was going to happen here. Additional work which even surpassed the explicitly shown horror. So it is revealing to think about this when you go through the Katie Nolan show. What has happened in this show? What's going to happen? What's supposed to happen? The danger is not only or not so much the physical violence of a physically superior murderer, a man. Many serial murderers were, you know, thin, weak. Its actual threat is based on his DIY work and the tools in the man cave hoarded there for atrocious purposes. In the Austrian version, the victims permanently lived under the same roof. By the way, this hoarding is also a res response to non-existent practical views which are not possible or appropriate for trade. So it's the second attempt to establish value. So these are quite dead things. Are they works of art? That's the question. Subcultures and scenes in the environment of hardcore and punk and the new forms of metal at the time, they developed a predilection for masculine or male violent. And they were beside another aesthetic milieu, but was more interested in queer, hard sex, BDSM, and metal tools. I'm referring to the industrial scene. Here it was a question of the masculinity of violence, but from a displaced perspective. Violet was interesting as sexuality, not a revenge on sexuality, as a further development, not its obsessive extermination. Both cultures in the 80s had a lot of in common, however. And strolling through the Caddy Noland exhibition, and I see all the hooks, the change, and the wires in the installations, 
I'm sometimes torn between two stools. Are these murder weapons or are they sex tools? Torture or nightlife? But also a DIY store or transgression? And finally, repression or aggression? As a global phenomenon, punk was too asynchronous and diverse to be able to trace a concrete or to trace concrete and different scenes to a common origin. There, there is no primeval punk, nowhere. However, what we can see is that there's a certain negation of 1968 with different nuances. And it emerged itself from 68, was around the whole time. It continued to simmer in the subcultures, was all the more fantastic, excited, and productive, the more the original critical reasons of mobilization faded into the background and had been culturally masked. It wasn't so easy to refute the rational ecological arguments of a green teacher or a minister or a priest, but one could hate the type it created and construct a counter model via this rejection. Politically speaking, the major renunciation of the cultural phenotypes of the hippie and or 68ers, which developed between the mid 70s and the 80s as different genres of punk, industrial or gothic culture, this could mean both that from a romantic to neo-traditional right-wing position, the old new left was reproached for naively misunderstanding and idealizing human nature or, indeed, nature itself in their rational and future-oriented political approach, or from the left-wing approach, they didn't go too far. They weren't left and radical enough. Both motives were often intertwined. Another artist, a contemporary of Katie Noland, and also a portrait painter of Charles Manson, we've heard of him together, I'm referring now to Raymond Pettibold. He illustrated this. He has many exhortations to kill hippies for various reasons, very different reasons, and there are murderous hippies with uh, pistols, guns, uh, threatening to assault you. There are punks and uh, radical right-wing people. In the core period of the development and dissemination of Nolan's work, 87 to 93, he, in fact, made four amateur videos. We've heard about them as well. They were critical in terms of ideology on the correlation and politicalization of Kerr, about cultural culture. Sir Jerome with Mike Watt and Mike Kelly on the ideologies of punk, Weatherman 69, featuring Gold, Kim Warden, Thurston Moore, etc., on the conceptions which white armed middle class fighters of weather underground have of Afro-American politics, but two further films refer Nolan, House of Manson, and above all, Citizen Tanya, which refers to the SLA, the Siemens Liberation Army. This group, uh, and we've heard about them already, were a collection of confused and differently politicized non-academics, but on paper, they in fact devised an idea of political struggle, which recalls what we call intersectionalism today. And in this paper, the, he goes into a lot of detail. I mean, this is one of the earliest texts in which it is decidedly said that, this, that queer struggles, non-whites and people of color, and the classical left struggles must all be seen together. Their leader, Donald de Vries, called himself Cinque. That was the head of the slave rebellion on Amistad, and the Siebel Spielberg filmed this, drafted a treatise, but actually it didn't really have much to do with the real action of the SLA. The SLA was referred to in 76 by the Ramones. Jackie was a punk, Judy was a runt. They both went to down to Frisco, joined the SLA. And oh, I don't know why. Oh, I don't know why. Perhaps they die. Oh yeah, die. Oh yeah. Finally, they kid out Patty Hurst, the granddaughter of the right-wing press uh, magnate, eccentric, and citizen Kane model Hurst, 
and a contemporary of Katie Nolan, Pettibon, and myself. She was imprisoned in dark for a long time, and then she joined the group and was involved in a number of robberies. Now, uh, most of the group was killed in a shootout, but then Hurst was taken to court and sentenced to seven years of prison. But presidents reduced her sentence and then pardoned her. Today, she has had a number of children and she is a successful dog breeder. But she's distanced herself from the SLA, but still, she hasn't broken off all her links with the countercultural milieu. For years, she plays in John Waters' films, and in his childhood, he was just as obsessed with her as Nolan and Petty Bone. And one of her roles, she is bludgeoned to death because of a terrible, unfashionable outfit. Patty Hurt doesn't die in reality, whereas the armed fighters around her fall. But she goes through a number of overlapping blame cycles. The blame cycle of the grandfather as a wicked and contradictory uh, patriarch, and she's his descendant, so she has to blame for this. She's also a past person targeted by uh, these attackers. And then she has to pay for a second uh, guild, nam namely the armed resistance against the patriarchal system. So she expiates her first sin and she survives the punishment for the uh, second sin in a way which is appropriate for a daughter of high birth. Clearly, other children of famous uh, fathers are interested in this history, not so much as Manson, but belong to the same cycle of the reformatting of American subculture. But unlike Pettibone and the hardcore punks uh, captivated by Ed Gein and Ted Bundy, the few references in Nolan's work do not seem to come from a sub uh, counterculture compared to her other more open and non-referential works. Metal printed uh, newspaper articles, headlines, photos, image captions all come from tabloids, New York Post or the Yellow Press. In terms of their fame, their drastic appearance, their filth, they are closer to pop art and uh, mainstream, uh, sorry, main, mainstream pop and pop art than any other underground. And it's similar if you look at the tools which could potentially be used for violence in the exhibition. They don't mainly come from the arsenal of individual eccentric violence, but stand for institutional repression, the violence of the building site. Parents are liable for their children, barricades, confinement, immobilization, more police violence than the Texas Chain Culture Massacre, at least uh, at the first glance. And it's interesting to note that it's just the oppression, the tools of dominance, not the dominated people. Now, what happens in the years in which the action is displaced from the roads and the beaches of the 60s and 70s to the cellars and the workshops of the 80s. The frequency of car parts, barbecue utensils and other components of a DIY culture provided basically by hardware stores, DIY stores and car body shops give a few indications in Nolan's exhibition. It's clearly about this. What do men do in their hobby cellars, in their man caves? So what do they do? They uh, kind of uh, familiarize us with some kind of action. So the words independent, indie, DIY, and self-empowerment become a different meaning than they usually have in the narrative of subculture history. Can we associate the history of independence, that is self-made records, independent clubs, youth centers, and occupied buildings, can we associate this with shelters of torture and stripped human skin? Is the fetidization of empowerment, the independent deed, is this an idea which is in continuity with the liberating effects of evil? Herschel Gordon Lewis in 65 referred to this in Color Me Blood Red and 
there is a workshop here which in fact is does establish a correlation between avant-garde and bl the bloodbath. It's half between Eve Klein and Hermann Kitsch, Hermann Nietzsche, excuse me. But this is a very uh, adapted uh, and uh, person who is in fact accepted as uh, an artist and then begins to paint uh, people who um, show blood. But it has been a widespread, uh, widespread conception in counter cultural milieu since the 60s that the tools offer a way for a new direction for the world. It intervenes in the parallel path of the armed struggle in the race of countercultural myths and it comes from two directions. One, the rejection of consumer culture and the positive assessment of, the, of work in terms of the Marxist category of practical value and two, the Californian hippie culture and their friends and relatives in states just like Colorado. Here we think of Stuart Brand and his whole Earth catalog propagating access to tools and these new humans moving into the country and doing or engaging in DIY, doing it themselves. Although in the northwestern world at the time there were rural communes set up of this kind, sometimes with indigenous, with Maoistic models, some without models, but the DIY components, the development of alternative architectures back to nature or forward to Buckminster Fuller, the fulfillment that a real man can find working with wood and hammers and tools of all kinds is much more a feature of the west coast of the US as opposed to the east coast or the European counterculture, whose intellectual wings criticize them in terms of instrumental sense and their vulgar criticism of consumer culture. Nevertheless, in many acts of later deep politicizing counterculture, there is an older governmentally skeptical, independent American individual anarchismus, and it comes into contact with this DIY ethics, which is home schooling, home birth, no vaccinations, etc. Until in the 80s, an explicit right-wing radical version of this culture to terms. You can go through Colorado now and ask locals and they will tell you when they see the people from these commune-type uh, trader camp uh, communities, they can tell whether these are people who are a militia and a public danger or whether they're simply old hippies who are vegans living in the country. You cannot tell what the difference between these long-haired, bearded women and um, using obsolete agricultural tools with the naked eye. The unpolitical mistrust of structures and structure leads to the hobby seller, which isn't so far from the county jail. At the same time, the DIY man measures himself with his counterpart, them above, on a territory which seems to allow a competition, allow room for a competition. He thinks the better will win, and the instruments are not individual and eccentric, but they come from the hardware store, the DIY store, standing for a standard in man or male tool management. It's a question of the mainstream asset, really good work, self-made industrial work. The powers that be have data, they've got their programs, their army on the policy, mass production. But when using uh, tools, the utensils and the most important tools, weapons, chains, hooks and tires. What is important is individual skills, the command of the tools. Hardware stores nowadays advertise on this basis with lowly men with a North German accent who are encouraged by the DIY stores to do their thing, do your thing, or doing your thing, which is the title of my presentation. Now you may ask, what is a thing therefore? In German, when you say, das ist ein Ding, what a thing that is, this expresses surprise about something, which is 
unusual, sometimes negative, but usually positive. For example, a, a surprise in sport. For a long time, a criminal plot was a thing, especially if it was characterized by a artistic and handicraft level, niveau, cooperation, composition, and precision. But a thing couldn't be done. It had to be pulled off. You couldn't pull it off yourself. So to pull a thing off implies cooperation. And doing things refers to the career of doing as a form of one DIY work and two, a lack of consideration. Just a um, brief review here at this point, just uh, in parenthesis, going back to the ambivalence comment I made at the beginning of my talk when I said hardware store or transgression, repression or aggression. A, unlike the earlier presentations in the 90s, which were very much standalone works, but now they have become clear. This was during a second walk through the exhibition. So there's much less ambivalence now. No hooks, no screws charged with industrial, with sex, with games, with transgression. Their aura, I would say, is rather dusty, despite the cultural references to power and violence close by. These objectives, or objects rather, don't oscillate between minimal theatrics, sculptural animism on the one hand, and aesthetically excessive critical pop ready made on the other. They are not eerie because they are spooky or charged, but because they are bone dry, as dry as bones. This violence is not erotic. And remember Tom, Byrne, Tom Burr's work a few years later, which deliberately eroticizes minimalism. And then you can see quite clearly what the difference is. But to come back to doing, in the 70s in Germany, people start talking about a macher, a doer, a man of action, a man with a cause. And this was an anticipated character of the drama of the end of Iologies, which actually appeared in the late 80s and the 90s in the Katie Nolan side. But this doer, in his major assentations, was present back then. This is someone who is allegedly positioned beyond right and left, who asserts himself against legal resistance and red tape, a pragmatic guy who gets things done, who lives in nothing, or who believes in nothing apart from his own assertiveness. assertiveness. The German Chancellor and Sir Karl Raymond Popper fan, Helmut Schmidt, who nominally, as a social democrat, ruled the country from 74 to 82 and was very popular across parties. And he was called a macha, a doer, when in 77 he hunted down assailants with an iron fist. Since then, German men do their thing. They don't have to pull it off anymore. The criminals that used to do this have lost, as well as the non-conformists who wanted to push their own thing through. Since then, men have been going to the hobby cellar. Now, this cellar is underground, but although it is a room for withdrawal, it is not completely surrounded by concrete walls. So this desire, the tools want out, you know, they are exalted uh, tools, the exalted, uh, they, they want to intervene in the, in the real world. So this desire, present in all arts and cultural practice, to intervene, to comment and participate, which authenticates and compensates for one's own significance or insignificance, also reaches their man caves and blows on their four walls ready to be stormed down. And this that gives us an open flank to reality. At this stage, perhaps, I should refer to a decisive error in my diagnosis. It mixes countercultural, colloquial, habitual, and mass cultural developments from Germany, or in general, Europe, with those in the States. The objection is valid that the overlap between the career of the German man of action 
on the way from Helmut Schmidt and social democratic pragmatism to the right-wing populism of another social democrat here in German, the financial political Sarrazin. That's what that on the one hand. This, on the other hand, only shows occasional ad hoc overlaps with the development from Ro Drop City to Waco. But I think that a decisive development which both narratives have in common is that we've got to ask the following question. Why and why did the men, why and and why did the men go to the hobby seller? And what has Carrie Nolan summarized in this narrative? Usually, the history description of the hippie culture and the 68 regards the development of the 68 feminism and other new social developments developing at the ends of the 70s. They regard them as an extension and complication of the old model of a f an earlier new left. Now, in this model, the female and neither white nor heterosexual supporters of the new left did not know that the classical left didn't uh, represent them until they began to reawake. And then they mentioned this and they, des they realized this and they deserted into their own identity policy. This is the usual narrative which we hear about identity policy. But another narrative is possible. Mike Kelly, another contemporary and uh, artist, uh, another contemporary of Kelly Nolan, has in his cycle Pay for Your Pleasure and Elsewhere regarded to the political psychology of the states. And he always refers to counterculture as a project of feminization. The universalism of counterculture wasn't a revival of the left, but it was a project of feminization, a type of proto-feminism, feminism, feminism, excuse me. And this narrative or description applied to the entire movement. All the participants between 65 and 69 became more and more feminine, and the feminine aspect was valorized. This project only changed when it was to have consequences for concrete walks of life, where there was no longer counterculture. Oscar Nicht and Alexander Kluger, once again referring to Germany, described this moment on the day when the organization of the German 68 revolt, the STS, disbanded, not least because there was considerable criticism from feminists about the male leaders of the revolt. I also mention this with reference to the state, uh, sorry, the country, uh, the town we are in the moment. And the Congress mentioned by Nick and Kluge took place here in Frankfurt. And the two div divided the CDS into three wings, the three factions which no longer agree with each other. One, the Berlin faction. Which, uh, separate, which represented a type of classical left-wing centralism, then a particularistic faction, including feminists and local initiatives, and then the Frankfurt faction, the Frankfurt faction, which were aware of the problem and could actually put the nail on the head. And they accused both the Berlin faction and the particulars of in being involved in an erroneous particularism. Hans-Jürgen Kral was a prominent member of a Frankfurt faction, and in 69, he described this schism as follows. He said there was a private appropriation of politics, which was the what Kelly calls feminization, but not the politicalization of the private sphere. The feminization was part of a private appropriation of politics, and it was used to heal the psychological prisons and the darker steps of forward post-fascist post-war bodies. But they were not politicized themselves. They had no idea of the historical and material basis their policy of the soul and relationship were based. 
Then, as feminism, feminism developed, this politicization of the uh, private sphere was regarded as a target, and this could be partly continued in feminism and other movements. But many men then began to pursue their hobbies, realpolitik, playing the guitar, dabbling in art, painting the garden fence, tuning a, motor bike, a motorbike. And some went into their hobby cellar. Here, they did all become monsters. On the contrary, Kelly Nolan's most important insight in the meta language of eagle, or towards the meta language of eagle, rather, is that the evil, uh, that evil, the evil, evil person and evil are not asocial, but they're over socialized. Successful social conformity achieved at the price of a split from internal sellers ranging from the smooth management of cognitive dissonances to completely multiple men in the other side of a normative authenticism which is also a remnant of hippie culture and a split off from this feminization project. The real split, to use a situational concept, was not the fact that the many new social movements betrayed the good old universal politics, as is often said today by the third alternative, but the fact that most men have departed from this politicalization and feminization project in their everyday understanding. It is from this split and the res this resistantly untouched further growth of the dialectics of the security industry and the enjoyment in spectacular violence that this dusty, biting complex emerges to which Noland has given more than an illustration.